My name is Dr. Werner Magnus Maximilian Freier von Braun. Impressive, eh? I was born in Poland on March 23rd, 1912, and from a young age acquired a massive interest in rockets and the idea of flying to the moon. I studied very hard in school and in college and was offered lots of jobs in making rockets. After some time in North Germany, I eventually invented the V2 rocket for outer space flight. I also created liquid fuel for jets and jet assisted takeoffs and super super anti aircraft missiles. In November 1937, I joined the Nazi party and became an SS officer from 1940 to the end of the war to keep my job. In 1944, Hitler used my V2 as a vengeance weapon of mass destruction in Britain killing 67,111 victims. However, more concentration camp slaves died making the weapon than the weapon killed. In the end, I was arrested in Nazi Germany for having a defeatist attitude and was falsely charged with trying to sabotage the V2. As the Soviets approached my research area on a Monday, I fled to America through war-torn Germany. Now I was running from Nazi officers as well, who wanted to kill us before my knowledge got out. We surrendered to America, and 300 train cars of V2 parts found their way to America. We joined the then secret Operation Paperclip and became a US citizen. I worked in the American ICBM program before joining NASA, where I served as the director of NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center and chief architect of the Saturn V. The Saturn V was the super booster which launched the US to the moon. Hello, my name is Sergei Pavlovich Kolov. I was born on December 30th, 1906. I too studied hard to reach my goal. At RNIR, I led the development of a cruise missile and of a manned rocket power fighter. On June 27, 1938, Stalin arrested me and sent me to the Gulag camps in Siberia and other areas. Stalin soon realized the importance of having aeronautical engineers to work for him. After the war with Germany, I was released from prison and appointed chief constructor for development of a long-range ballistic missile. I created the world's first intercontinental ballistic missile, ICBM. I managed to convince the officials to allow me to place a satellite inside the rocket. The satellite was the first satellite ever working. Sputnik 1, 4th of October 1957. We could now proceed to use ICBM for nuclear warfare, but I wanted to move on. My eyes were set on the moon. During the 1960s, I began the campaign to beat the Americans. I got the first man into space, and the first objects on the moon and around it. My last objective was to make a super booster that would reach the moon. It was to be called the N-1 but it never made a successful flight. I died in the end from a botched hemorrhoid operation. History changed on October the 4th, 1957, when the Soviet Union successfully launched Sputnik 1. The world's first artificial satellite was about the size of a basketball, weighed only 183 pounds, and took about 98 minutes to orbit the Earth on its elliptical path. That launch ushered in new political, military, technological and scientific developments. While the Sputnik launch was a single event, it marked the start of the Space Age and the US-USSR space race. In July 1955, the White House announced plans to launch an Earth-orbiting satellite for the IGY and solicited proposals from various government research agencies to undertake development. In September 1955, 
the Naval Research Laboratory's Vanguard proposal was chosen to represent the US during the IGY. The Sputnik launch changed everything. As a technical achievement, Sputnik caught the world's attention and the American public off guard. Its size was more impressive than the Vanguard's intended 3.5 pal- payload. In addition, the public feared that the Soviet's ability to launch satellites also translated into the capability to launch ballistic missiles that could carry a nuclear weapon from Europe to the US. The Sputnik 1 satellite was a 58 centimeter diameter aluminium sphere that carried four whip-like antennas that were 2.4 to 2.9 meters long. The antennas looked like long whiskers pointing to one side. The instruments and electric power sources were housed in a sealed capsule and included transmitters operated at 20.005 and 40.002 MHz. A spacecraft obtained data pertaining to propagation of radio signals in the ionosphere and the density of the upper layers of the atmosphere. Rising, rising, rising nations!